and can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. It's uh, very nice to talk to you today. Um, and uh, I'm going to give you a quick gallop through um, a topic that, I, that is exercising companies all over the world. Um, people talk about having a coaching and mentoring culture, um, or just sometimes just a coaching culture, but actually making it happen and envisioning exactly what it is becomes much more difficult. So I'm going to give you um, a, a sort of overview of, of what it what looks like good practice from our researches and our interventions in organizations of all sizes around the world. But firstly, um, let's, uh, let, let's look at the, at the, uh, the first the of first slides. Um, uh, I, this is just a very brief introduction. It's, it's the network that I run. It's a, it's a bunch of trainers and consultants around the world. Uh, in 40 countries plus at the moment, it will be 60 by the end of this year, uh, if all goes well. Um, and basically, everybody in this network is um, trained and accredited to deliver coaching and mentoring training. So they're all specialists in coaching and mentoring um, and, cons and helping organizations deliver um, culture or create cultures um, full of people that understand coaching and understand mentoring. Professor, if I may interrupt you, uh, Professor, could you just run it in the slideshow mode so we can have a full screen view? We can. There we go. We got that? Uh, I think it'll take a second to run. Yes, sir. It is coming. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So, um, again, just very briefly about me. You've already had a slight introduction from me. Uh, but uh, I think the main thing there is, is uh, uh, my, I spend my time partly in researching, coaching and mentoring, partly in working with larger organizations um, around the whole area of uh, coaching and mentoring. Uh, so if we look at the uh, coaching and mentoring, it's a good idea it's just to, to clarify what we mean by them, because very often we get very different perceptions as to what, as to, as to what people think they are. Some people will define coaching by, and in terms that others would define mentoring and vice versa. So basically the difference between coaching and mentoring is the coaching focuses on performance and skills, mentoring focuses on much broader issues and intent, therefore tends to be much more long term, it always has some career element within it. Both of them focus on the personal development of people. Um, we do have actually two models of coaching and two models of mentoring prevalent in the world. One model of both is quite directive, um, the other is very non-directive. So we have, in the, from, mainly from the United States, what we would call sponsorship mentoring, which is a, which is a kind of godfathering, where the, um, the authority of the mentor and their ability to do things on behalf of the protege, uh, somebody who's protected, is, is emphasized. Um, and then we have, emanating from Europe, um, much more modern mentoring, which is called developmental mentoring, which relies much more on asking people questions and, and helping, we talk about a mentor as somebody who uses their wisdom, uh, and wisdom is basically um, your reflection on your experience, um, but somebody who uses their wisdom to help somebody else develop their own. So it's, a, uh, it, it's much more hands off and helping people to think things through for themselves and take charge of their own careers and their own personal development. Um, in coaching, we have, a, we have most coaching around the world is still very directive. It's about somebody giving, observing somebody else and giving them feedback. Um, however, in part emerging out of developmental mentoring, developmental exec, uh, men, coaching, which is sometimes called executive coaching, uh, tends to be much more about helping people to um, access their own desires and, and, and work on their own goals um, through really thinking through deeply. We talk about it really as, as having a converse, uh, getting to understand your inner world and also getting to understand your outer world and having the conversation that enables you to link the two. So that's, the, that, that, that's a sort of broad overview of what, coaching, what we can define or what we mean by coaching and mentoring. Now, if you've got a coaching and mentoring culture, it's heavily associated with high performance um, at all levels, individual, team, and organizational. Studies from the United States indicate that organizations where the top team spends 50% or more of its time in a coaching mindset, not necessarily doing coaching, but in a coaching mindset, um, these are ultimate, are amongst the highest performing companies. And you can see by, com by comparison, companies where the top, the top team spends very little time in, uh, in a coaching mindset 
tend to be the lowest performing companies. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of evidence to demonstrate that mentoring and coaching are connected with much greater employee engagement, uh, greater job commitments, so people are pleased to be in their jobs, and retention. Um, it, it, the, 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 the typical um, retention of having a mentoring program, for example, um, is at least one third more likely to keep somebody who's mentored than somebody who's not. Uh, in one particular program within um, what is now GlaxoSmithKline Beecham, um, there was um, a, 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 um, a difference of 1,300% between the control group of non-mentor people and the mentor people in terms of retention at a time of great upheaval. That's an outlier, but it gives you an indication of how powerful it can be. Coaching and mentoring are associated with much greater creativity and with strategic flexibility being able to challenge what's going on in the organization. You have honest, more honest conversations. Um, and that's the last of these things, that people are able to, to actually question what's happening in their organization and in their team. There's greater psychological safety, as it's called. And therefore, you actually, uh, you, that again is associated with higher performance. So there's lots of good reasons for having people adopt a coaching and mentoring culture. So some of the characteristics that you might identify. So <coughs> one of the things, that comes out is that in most organizations you might have personal development plans for people, um, you've got business plans for the team and you've got business plans for the organization. But in, culture, in organizations that have a, a coaching and mentoring culture, we would typically find that those three processes are integrated. The development of individuals, the development of teams, and the development of the organization are much more closely aligned um, and, and there are systems to make that happen. In Positive, in, in coaching and mentoring cultures too, people are able to challenge things that they, that they feel are wrong. Um, they're able to make suggestions knowing they're not going to be jumped on for, and, and being seen as naive. Um, uh, people like to have feedback. Um, uh, and the, the, the top managers, for example, set, um, set our role models for asking people to give honest feedback about what they're doing and, and how they're doing. Uh, and when coaching happens, it's not just something that coaches do to people, or that line managers do to people, it's something that, 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 that it's coaching is something you do with people. And so the responsibility for developing um, your, your, yourself um, and for, is, 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 is actually shared with your manager. And, and that's a big shift for many people who expect the manager just to, to sort it out for them. In many organizations, we, that we, we see it going a lot further. In many organizations, the team becomes the core of the, of the, co of the coaching culture. And in, in, in learning teams, everybody takes responsibility for everybody else's learning, or for assisting everybody else in their learning. That's a big change. Some more, some more characteristics. People understand what it looks like to be a good developer of other people. Some organizations won't actually allow a person to get promoted if they can't demonstrate a high track record for developing themselves and developing others. Um, when coaching is seen as something you only get when you've got a problem, then people tend to avoid it and it gets a very negative reputation. But when it's seen as something that's actually there as a privilege and something that's re that is beneficial for both you and the organization um, and for the team, then that's a very different atmosphere. And that's, what, that's the kind of mindset you see in, in, in organizations that have moved a long way towards a coaching and mentoring culture. Um, Many organizations reward people. IBM is one that does this for, 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 for sharing their knowledge. Um, so make it to so that encourage them to do that. People take time as well to think. One of the things we train people to do in board meetings, which is and in team meetings, which is quite uh, very powerful. We ask people to when there's a difficult topic to talk about, we get everybody to spend the first five minutes just thinking about three basic coaching questions. What do I want to say? What do I want to hear, and what do I want to achieve out of this discussion? Everybody says, in turn, what they've written down. And then the discussion begins. And what we find is, firstly, the discussion takes half the time. Secondly, there's so much more respect, because people were to say to somebody that was perhaps an introvert, that you had some real problems about this. Are we addressing your issues? Um, and then when, it is, if, if, when they, it's thought that maybe there's a, a consensus, that there's an agreement, the person chairing the meeting goes around and says, did you say what you wanted to say? Did you hear what you wanted to hear? Did you achieve what you wanted to achieve? 
And if anybody says no, then you revisit it. But at the end of this dialogue, you come away with a decision that is firm. If nobody's going to try and remake it in the corridor later, as so often happens in organizations. Um, so this is just one example of basically creating time for people to think and valuing thinking time. Um, not always easy to do in many organizations. Then to what are the barriers to learning? In some cases, we found organizations that are very hostile to learning. We have a, 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 a number of ways of, of, of measuring this. And, and in, in those circumstances, um, for example, in one, in, there are a number of firms where they measure every 10 minutes of your time. And if you haven't got some time, a time allocation there laid out for learning, then it isn't going to happen. Um, Another characteristic is that people start looking inside the, the, the organization for their next job. They know that their line, if they talk to their line manager about wanting to, to, to move on, to be promoted, to do bigger things, their line manager will encourage them, not try and hold them back. Um, we see good role models for coaching. Um, people who, actually, who spend a lot of their time and, 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 and actually spend a lot of time learning how to be better coaches. And then the mentoring side too. Many times people say, well, why, why should I mentor I've got enough problems looking after the people in my own team. Why would I want to mentor somebody else? Well, one of the answers is it's a great opportunity to practice developmental behaviors in a less threatening environment because there's less at stake if you're doing it with somebody who isn't one of your direct reports. So you can learn to be better at developing others in, by doing it, in, in doing it in the role of a mentor. Um, also, we find that in a, a highly developed coaching and mentoring culture, the mentors actually often learn as much, sometimes more, than the mentees from that relationship. And there's a sort of, there's, there's a tipping point here. When you get enough formal mentoring, properly trained mentors in an organization, then you find that the informal mentoring just happens. Now, informal mentoring without training can be a really dangerous thing. Because what you're doing is, is the people who are doing the mentoring are reproducing the habits and the, and, and, and the behaviors that they have had from their generation. Um, and that may not what be what's needed in the future. Um, and very often what happens, the people who are most active mentors are the people who you least want people to copy. Um, and so, <clears throat> so actually having the informal mentoring based upon really good training and, and, and the high and kind of experienced mentors is very beneficial. So that's what it looks like. But then, do you want it? And the kind of questions we, we suggest that people ask are, <coughs> what kind of culture do you need in your business if you're going to survive and thrive in the next 10 years? Do you want to be different from your competitors? Um, in which case, how are you going to do that? So what's the source of that differentiation? Do we believe we can maintain long-term competitive advantage through exceptional performance of our people? If we do, we can't achieve that without creating a coaching culture. And then, <coughs> how much change are we ca in, in culture are we capable of undertaking? That's a, that's a really tough one because it means you've got to stick with it for a number of years. It don't, won't happen overnight. And one of the biggest mistakes companies make is to underestimate the amount of change that has to happen amongst the people at the top. Indeed, in one organization I've been working with in recent years, uh, <coughs> the, the chief executive realized that unless people stopped to doing jobs that other people could do below them, they were never going to change, never going to grow themselves and become, and so, so they needed to be coaching. But they were, they were too busy doing, doing things and, and not enough time thinking about what they should be doing and, being, and taking a more strategic view to take on new roles. And so it's, part of their, it's measured every year how much of your job did you give away, did you delegate to other people. And the target for each of these top 150 people in this company is 25% of their job every year should be delegated to people below them. That's a challenge. So <laughs> let's define a strategy, because if you want to get a culture, you have to have a strategy to create it. So a coaching mentoring strategy is, as we say here, an integrated and planned approach to building organizational competence for coaching and mentoring internally and also to using external coaching and mentoring resources with higher efficiency, achieving value for money from both internally and externally resourced coaching and mentoring, and by externally resourced we mean buying in executive coaches from outside, um, and making sure that coaching and mentoring are properly aligned to the corporate strategy. So you're focusing your efforts around things which are priorities for the business. And 
And what we find is that you've got all of these elements that you can put into place. Now, what you don't need to do is do them all at once. But the further along the route towards being the creating a coaching mentoring culture that people have gone, the more of these elements they've got and the greater the more advanced the stage they have of them. So I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about most of these. <coughs> so if you are using external coaches, and I'm sure many of you are, you will probably have wondered whether they're any good. Well, we've been doing um, quite a lot of um, executive coaching um, uh, assessment centers um, and part of the problem there is that most of the people that put themselves forward are actually not very good. In fact we can't find any correlation between number of hours of coaching that people say they've done um, or the reports back from their clients because it's not a very reliable um, measure because the clients don't know what to look for um, or fee rates um, or whether they're part of a coaching pool, um, it doesn't seem to make much difference. The only point at which we've been able to find a differentiating factor, something that, that, that says this person um, is, uh, is better than others, is they, that um, people who have a master's degree in coaching will have a lot of good knowledge about coaching, but that doesn't necessarily make, give them the skills of an expert coach. Um, so it's a big problem. Um, and from the work that, that, that we've done, we found in, when we do coach assessment centers, 70% of the coaches that people have used before are found to be inadequate for the role. Now, that's pretty frightening. Now, you can do a lot about that by simply taking on really good interview techniques um, and, and using those to really get underneath the philosophy of the coach, the, what, what they, how they approach their coaching, what they're really capable of. Um, and tip, especially when you observe them in real plays, you can, and, and in, in a structured way, you can begin to get an idea of, has this person got what's needed? Would you really want to pay them the money that you're going to pay them to work with your senior people? You can also start to create from so, those people within the organization who are interested in the role, internal coaches. And interestingly, we cannot find any evidence at all from the research or practice that these people cannot be as good as the, at least the average of the externally resourced coaches. Um, so you can create the, this group of, of coaches, and I'm going to come back to them in a minute. Um, coaching within the work team. Coaching is something we find that happens naturally. Anyway, in many group, work groups, you get a newcomer, and somebody else helps them to learn, um, particularly to, to learn, learn how to do the job. Um, but you, <coughs> you can make this a much more um, extensive approach and you can actually help line managers to become more effective uh, coaches. And we'll talk a little bit more again about that too. Team coaching is the term we apply to when somebody comes in from outside the team and actually focuses not, not on team and focusing co coaching individuals but coaching the team collectively. Now this is a growing area. Many people who talk about or say they do team coaching are actually doing team building or team facilitation rather than team coaching. But it's a specialist area which is now getting properly accredited uh, internationally um, and gives you a, 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 an ability to, to, act, to, to improve the performance of the whole team and, most importantly, equip the team with the skills to be able to continue to, to improve its performance. That's a big difference between that and facilitation, where facilitation solves a specific problem the team has. Team coaching builds the team's capability to continue to develop and grow in its performance. Developing a coaching mindset, how do you get people to think in coaching terms? Um, uh, so how do you, when, when there's a crisis, do they relapse back into, into command and, and control? Or do they, uh, do they find ways of using coaching more effectively uh, to help people actually work out what is it we need to do right now? What's the most important thing here? Um, which is much more effective. There's a lot of resources that you can put in place. Intranet platforms, for example, um, with lots of data about uh, that, that helps people with techniques for better coaching and better mentoring. Um, <clears throat> there's a whole area around nurturing talent um, and, and, and also around diversity. Something like 60% of the mentoring programs now being introduced around the world have some element of diversity management within them. It's been shown that mentoring is the most effective tool for improving 
diversity in uh, the senior levels of a large organization. Knowledge transfer. IBM, again, very, very big on using mentors as people to, um, to help others um, by, by sharing their knowledge. Uh, particularly when you've got a lot of people who are moving towards retirement, how do you retain that knowledge inside the organization? Well, creating mentoring relationships is one of the most powerful ways of doing that. You need some measurement. You need to be able to help people work out, is this working? You know, both at the corporate level, how are we progressing, how much are we progressing towards a coaching culture? Um, and at the individual level, what's the quality of the coaching that's being done? Um, top management, as in all of these things, have to be sponsored for, for this. They have to be role models of, of as well. And so that means role models in being coached and role models in coaching other people um, so that you demonstrate how important it is. In one organization with a very hostile developmental climate, the, 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 the chief executive wanted to change things and coaching and mentoring were important parts of that package. But in order to do that, he came to every single training session for coaches and mentors and talks about his experience, both the coach and as a mentor and a coachee and mentee. And that legitimized the whole process because it was good enough for him, it was good enough for everybody else. Many organizations are creating roles where people ask become specialists in looking in managing coaching and mentoring. So a head of coaching or a mentoring, mentoring program manager or both put, combine those two roles. And finally, supervision. Supervision is where you actually have ongoing oversight of what's happening in, in, in coaching. So people, when they run into problems in coaching and mentoring, have got somebody to talk to about it and so to, to help them think about their further development as a coach or mentor, but also to deal with issues that come up, which, they're not, which, they, which perhaps have um, um, elements in them that they can't deal with. Perhaps the person's got a psycho, the client, the mentee or the project coachee has um, a psychological issue or a, a, a major problem of, of lack of self-belief. Supervisor can help you help them to actually think through how they work with that. Um, <clears throat> when you want, clearly there are lots of times when you want to use an external coach. Um, and these are just some of the ways, the times when you would do that. Um, and I think these are fairly obvious. If the, if the executive can't be open, wouldn't be open to an insider. If they want specific expertise the organization doesn't have, or they want a role model, um, but there isn't an appropriate role model within organization, the organization. This is frequently the case where you've got a woman wanting to get on, get into the top team or the C-suite, but she can't find any, any effective role model, a male role models above. There are no other women there, so she's got to go, go outside <coughs> the organization for that help. Um, sometimes <coughs> somebody who's inside the organization can be blind to a lot of the, 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 the ways that, that things are done, the natural culture. Or they may be caught up in the politics or afraid of the politics of the organization. So somebody from outside um, who's, who's naive to this um, is much less affected by it. And of course, some coaching in particular has a psychological element to it. Um, and there are specialist coaches who, or, or specialists who are both coaches and psychologists who work with people who need a little bit more behavioral or psychological help to overcome their performance problems. When you want to use an in internal coach, it's in lots of situations, but these two are the most important. When, there's, when an understanding of the organization is important to the role, and whenever there's a clear and specific business case that, need, that can be made, and so, uh, or can't be made for, the, for, for, for external permission, rather. So if you can do it inside, then you should do it in, for, with internal resources. If you can't, then you need to go outside, but bearing in mind the cost of going outside. Some organizations have now literally hundreds of uh, well-trained, uh, properly accredited internal coaches who coach not only within their own teams, but across the organization. And these are the kind of questions you ask, because it's going to take 100 hours of investment of their time and interest, so they really going to want to do it. Um, they're going to need support, particularly from supervision um, and from further learning. Um, <clears throat> we find that lots of these organizations have coach groups where they come together, um, or coach and mentor groups, where they come together um, regularly once a quarter and learn from each other, sometimes have an external speaker in to help as well. Um, there is an issue, an issue of credibility with more senior managers. If you're trying to coach somebody more senior in the organization, how do you do that? Well, again, that, need, that needs attention. Um, keeping them developing. If they get bored, they go stale. And so you have to constantly move them forward. One of the things we're doing in the UK, which is, which is um, 
which is unique, um, is um, the, the, the concept of ethical mentors. And many of some organizations, um, including the health service um, uh, in, in the UK, are <coughs> taking their existing coach pools, you know, internal coach pools, and they're equipping them additionally with understanding of ethical issues. Um, so, or, or, or ethical um, ethical management, um, and so what? So they these people now have deep expertise in ethicality and deep expertise as coaches and mentors. They're now able to to work with people who are helping them to, to recognize and forestall ethical dilemmas that might occur within the organisation. Um, and then many of the organisations, um, such as Diageo, uh, Barclays, Standard Chartered, which have had some issues of, of, of um, in, in um, where they're, they're publicly they've lost reputation um, because of ethical problems are, are using ethical mentors now as a tool for helping to, 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 to actually open up the debate and make people more ethically aware. Um, and the issue of how you compare them against externally resourced executive coaches, you know, how can you, can, can you compare how, how good they are? Well, one of the ways to measure is, is to measure both, put them both through an assessment center process. Um, we wanted to, uh, to work out a while ago, why was it, or how long did it take when line managers went off on a, on a line manager's coach course, how long did it take for them to, to go back to their normal behaviors? And now, to our surprise, our shock, the average that came back was three days. So if somebody's gone on a two-day course and they fence, and three days later, they've forgotten everything and, and no longer use everything they've learned, this is not a good investment. And we found this was typical. What was, ha what was happening was that when you, when you go off on, on into one of these, these um, training courses, you may come back all enthusiastic, but it's only you that's been trained. And it's a bit like trying to do the tango when only one person knows the steps. And the reaction of the, of the team when the manager comes back is first the, what drugs is he on? Can I have some? Um, that's being a little facetious, facetious but, but you know, there is a sort of one, what, what, what's wrong with him? And then the, the discomfort, um, you know, because when, if coaching is done well, it's, it makes people think, which is uncomfortable. If it's done badly, it's clunky and robotic, and it equally makes them uncomfortable. And so this, in, in, in systems theory, when you change one small part of a theory, of a system, the rest of the system works very hard to bring things back to normal. And that's what was happening in all the teams we looked at. So what we found the cure was, and organizations like ASDA, National Grid, and so forth, um, and some universities have, have found that this works remarkably well. You go in and use the team as the fulcrum the, for, for, for the coaching culture. So everybody need, in the team needs to understand the basics of coaching. So they learn together with the, with the manager, at, at, usually around their, type, their team meetings. Everybody learns how, everybody learns how to be coached. Um, <coughs> The, the, the sessions are usually quite short, usually an hour or 90 minutes most, but they happen, as I say, at the end of a, of a team meeting or just before the normal team meetings. The positive psychological contract, the people contract with each other about making it safe to speak up and, and appear naive. Anybody can be coached by anyone, and that means the, lead, the team leader can be coached by members of the team. And we, in fact, we ask them to share their personal development plan with the team. So you create a team development plan which is a core part of the process. And you create enough time to sit down and think about how we're going to apply our learning to, or about coaching and mentoring to the way that we work within this team. It's incredibly powerful, and it does make an enormous difference very radically in, in how that team works and how they behave towards each other. We already talked about team coaching. And here's the definition. It's helping the team improve performance, <coughs> and the, the processes by which performance is achieved through reflection and dialogue. So it's taking the whole team into a coaching conversation and helping them to work through how collectively do we deal with the issues that we have and how do they learn to take on new norms, new skills within the, within the team itself. Um, <clears throat> again, it's a, it's a very rapidly growing um, area of, um, of, of coaching and it's also, I think, one of the most effective interventions that you can have within a team, especially if it's a new team. Um, and because what we find is that teams that, that have just a point, a point uh, um, set up can get to that through the storming, forming, norming to performing in about half the time 
that it would normally take a team to do so. So <clears throat> supporting all this, you know, you've got a whole mix of technologies. You've got face-to-face -face coaching or mentoring. Um, that's what most that's where most of it was, was done. But increasingly virtual coaching and mentoring um, is 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 come is uh, is being um, applied in hundreds and hundreds of organizations. And one of the interesting things it turns out that where, whereas you might have thought, and I certainly fifteen years ago thought that e coach coaching or e mentoring, for example, would be inferior to face to face, actually turns out it's not inferior, it's just different. Um, and some of the pluses are if you give people time to think if it's an A group synchronous emails you have time to reflect on the questions you want to ask and the answers you want to give. You've got a written record so you don't have to take notes, which gets in the way of, of, of attending to the conversation. And also the power distance, the, the ability of people to open up and be more honest in conversations by email is much higher than face-to-face. -face. Um, you only have to look at what people will say about themselves on Facebook to see how, to see how that works. Skype and video conference are important and, and very helpful. Um, and there's this halfway house. Telephone is the least effective medium because it, you can't see the person, but you've got long silences. And, but you can't leave the silences to, for very long because then you don't know if the person's still there. Um, there's a whole range of other social media, um, uh, obviously from, from Twitter through, through, through to Facebook and LinkedIn and so forth. They're all part of the process. Um, and coaching and mentoring platforms tend to be um, uh, databases where you've got masses of information. And, and self diagnostics and tools that can support the coaching and mentoring behaviors. So, if we look at the platforms, the critical things you'll find there's a lot of educational content. Very often, there's a resource for HR. So, such to how do they support uh, coaching and mentoring? If it's uh, mentoring, it's uh, that you have um, particularly how do you match people? So, there's, there's a resource for getting people together. You can you have measurement tools so that you can measure the progress of a relationship, for example, or the progress of learning. Um, you can market it, or any initiatives that you do through, through the, the platform. Um, <clears throat> you can set up learning networks where people can actually take over the learning process for themselves. Um, obviously, online support is helpful, um, and maybe sometimes you want an instant response. Um, and some organisations are doing this through, through a kind of ask Jeeves, a sort of um, uh, automated response. But others actually will have um, have on, on uh, people who are assigned the role of being available if, if, every day. Um, for a specific amount of time to answer queries that people might have if they need support as coach or mentor. Part of the problem of, that we find in so many organizations in creating a coaching culture is whether you can measure things. Increasingly what we find is that when you have a coaching assignment, the short-term goals that have been set for the coach uh, and the client actually conflict with the long-term goals. Um, What's the, what makes it even more complex is that the goal somebody starts with in a coaching or mentoring relationship almost invariably changes as they go along and they understand their context, both the inner context and their outer context more deeply. In a recent study of 200 coaches in the States, uh, all but nine said that they regularly experienced um, the fact that the, the, the goals of the assignment changed as you got deeper into understanding the context. Um, <clears throat> the things that you can most easily fix um, um, the, the simple performance issues um, are often, they're, they're just the tip of the iceberg. The thing where coaching has its biggest impact very often is, is subsequently, maybe six months, I even had an email from somebody um, earlier this year telling me that I'd given them some brief coaching 15 years before at a conference and they had been thinking about the questions they asked ever since and the guy said, and two years ago I finally managed to answer one of those questions and I changed my career completely. And I just wanted to write and say thank you. I have no idea what the questions were. I have no idea what I said. Can't even remember him. Um, but it, but it's, it's the, the longer term impact, which is obviously often much bigger. Um, and client self-assessment, if somebody has been lis listened to um, and, and had somebody really pay real attention to them for an hour, they feel very good about it. Whether it's done any good is a completely different matter. And what we find is the more the client, if a client is naive, there is no correlation with their, their perceptions or their evaluation and, and anything. If, however, the client has been trained as a coach themselves, um, you typically, or, or has been experienced good coaching in the past, you find that their assessment of the, of the coaching is much closer to that of a trained observer. Um, but basically, most of the time, client assessment isn't very worth, worth 
uh, taking much notice of. In our researches um, some years ago, we identified four layers of, of coaching culture. When you're in a nascent area, uh, <coughs> there's not much commitment from the organization. Coaching, when it happens, is highly inconsistent in both frequency and quality. Um, top managers aren't very good role models. Um, and, when th when an urgent, when, and if they do have coaching behaviors, they abandon them when there's a crisis. Um, if there's executive coaching, it's uncoordinated and usually the result of somebody having performance problems. Um, people tend to avoid tackling difficult behavioral or ethical issues. Um, those, that, would, that would be typical of an organization that's just starting to think about it. Then you get to the tactical stage, and there the organization has recognized the value of establishing a coaching culture, but doesn't really understand what it means or what's going to be involved in it. So top management sees the issue as primarily one for HR. Um, you've got systems in place to train coach the mentors, and you've got lots of discrete uh, HR systems, such as succession and planning and appraisal, but there's no link between all these. Um, and there's a broad understanding among individual contributors and managers of the potential benefits of coaching, but commitment to coaching behaviors isn't very high, certainly in terms of making it the predominant management style. At the strategic stage, <coughs> there's been a lot of effort expanded to educate managers and employees in the value of coaching and to give people the competence and therefore the confidence to coach in a variety of situations. People are rewarded for delivering co for good, good coaching, um, typically through direct appraisal by their direct reports, so upward appraisal. Um, top management see themselves as role, role models and they spend time getting across to people the importance of exhibiting coaching behaviors and how coaching behaviors are business drivers rather than just something for, 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 for something with limited impact. And gradually they're starting to integrate coaching and mentoring with the wider portfolio of HR systems. Then at the embedded stage, and there aren't many organizations that have got there yet, um, people at all levels are engaged in coaching, both formal and informal, both in colleagues in, with colleagues in the same function and across functions and across all levels. Some senior executives are mentored by more junior people. Um, and this widespread use of 360 degree feedback at all levels to provide insults, insights into where people can most benefit from it. These are not generic 360s. These are specific 360s related to the, their own development needs. Um, many of you will not know where 360 originally came from, but I, I brought it back from the Soviet Union a number of decades ago where it was created as a tool for keeping line managers um, under control um, by the, the communist trade union. Um, in many organizations, it hasn't really changed a great deal. Use it properly, though, it has tremendous impact. So those are the four levels of coaching culture that we see. You can measure all of those things. You can measure the coaching behaviors of the line manager. You can measure the coaching behaviors of the coaches and the team members. You can measure the quality of that coaching relationship or mentoring relationship. And you, look at, and you can look at real outcomes, performance outcomes, learning outcomes, enabling outcomes. That's things like um, having a better plan, personal development plan, for example, and emotional ones like having greater self-belief. We talk about skinny individual outcomes being specific skills and uh, or behaviors, and then wider ones, or out, uh, and, and then wider ones, obviously, these, these, more, these broader personal development ones. Um, but outcomes for other stakeholders too, you know, how is this team better able to serve its customers? So nearly at the end there, so if you want to measure mentoring, one of the things that's been learned is you measure it longitudinally over several, over a period of time, maybe at least 12 months to see what happens because the relationship goes through clearly defined phases and there are different things happening at each phase. And again, you've got, you've got the different kind of individual outcomes and they would tend to be related to your career as opposed to performance your learning, um, the, the development, your enabling again, and your emotional again. And you'd look at organizational outcomes, such as retention and, and job commitment. Um, ideally, what you'd do is, is to create a balanced portfolio to look at all these. And then you can also, if you, once you've got your program established for a year, you can look at getting it measured against international standard. So the international standards for mentoring programs in employment is the primary um, tool that organizations use to benchmark how good is our system and how, how effective, how well does it compare to the best in the world. And the last three things on my list of things that, that, that organizations do um, was having top management sponsors and role models. You know, it, it can't be overemphasized the impact of management behavior because managers are role models. 
Um, and if they don't have time for coaching and mentoring, you pretty well shouldn't bother uh, to, uh, to, to, to try and create a, a company-wide coaching and mentoring culture. You can start to do it within specific divisions. And we found a number of cases where um, actually what's happened is in, in, in specific areas, people have started to create a coaching mentoring culture and it's thrived. And the graduates of that coaching mentoring culture have gradually taken over the organization and eventually changed the whole organization. Um, but those are the good stories. Um, coaching and mentoring management, having somebody who's trained and qualified to, 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 to do things like assessing external coaches, who can design programs internally to support internal coaches, um, and can provide and can manage and can manage all the resources that are needed to create to, to, to sustain a coaching and mentoring culture. And professional supervision, and which means professional because there's a lot of people who call themselves supervisors who are just coaches who've done who say they've done a lot of that of ours. That's not adequate. The role of professional accredited supervisor is now growing. It's one of the things that we, that we see for both mentoring and, and coaching um, initiatives that you you have that resource in the background. If people run into problems, you've got somebody there who is professionally qualified to help them make uh, deal with those problems. So that, in a short, very short um, uh, time and bang on time, I see, is um, uh, is an overview for of, of what's happening internationally in terms of creating coaching cultures. I wish I could say that there are dozens and dozens of examples of organizations that have gone all the way there and, and, and are totally operating in a coaching mode. That isn't the, that isn't the case. Um, but we see a lot of organizations that aspire to it. In the, and since we actually set our measures of nascent uh, uh, and uh, a tactical strategic embedded, <coughs> we've seen a lot more organizations move towards the, into the strategic box. Um, it's, uh, it's a journey. And it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort to stay there, um, and it and it takes a time. But the rewards are about the survival of the organisation and the thrival of the organisation for the long term. Thank you for listening to me. Well, thank you very much, Professor David Clutterberg, for a very interesting presentation. Uh, folks, we are now open for Q and A. If you have any questions, please feel free to. Raise your hand. There's a hand icon available on your webinar console. So if you click on it, I shall give you an opportunity to speak to Professor. Or you could put your questions in the question box, and I'll be happy to read them over uh, on your behalf. Uh, let me move. We already have one caller, so let me go straight to the raised hand. We have uh, Mr. Adam Tefnell. Mr. Adam, could you please introduce yourself and ask a question? Hello, Adam. Can you hear us? Uh, Mr. Adam Tufnell, uh, I believe I uh, unmuted you. You raised your hand, so I believe you're having some technical issues with that audio. So let me move to the question box. Uh, there are some interesting questions. Uh, let me see. No, not this one. Uh, okay, there you go. So there's an interesting question um, uh, from, uh, from an attendee that values and beliefs and personal characteristics and attitudes are the most difficult areas to help a person change. What is the best approach to help such leaders decide if there is a need to change and why it would benefit them personally? Okay. Uh, there are many, many tools and techniques that one can use, but the one that I find gets to, to the to the number of it straight away is to ask them what's your purpose um, and um, they usually look at what, what's your purpose as, a, as an individual what is it that you want to have, achieved, to, to have changed in the world before you die um, and this becomes very different from them thinking about you know I want to make lots of money what do you what is your purpose you know, making money is just a means to an end and so, so people say, well, I want to make lots of money. One would say, in service of what? What is it you want to do as a result of making, making lots of money? And so basically we link people to, 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 to continuously higher purposes. And then you can work down to what, to what they do. Um, and getting people to, um, it, we, we know that the quality of mentoring and coaching relationships is very highly related to the sense that people share values. 
So if you feel that something you share something with others, you will be much more open with them. You have a much better quality of relationship. So I think to some extent, coaching and mentoring are all about values and, and helping people to work through and identify their values more more clearly. And as a result, then to be able to find ways of living, making those values um, uh, live in the work that they do and the life that they lead. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Adam has sent me a chat box or request again. We'll try to unmute him again. Let's see if it works this time. Uh, Mr. Adam Tufnell, can you hear us, sir? Hello, Adam. Unfortunately, we can we cannot hear him again. So let me move to another question. Uh, there's another question. Uh, uh, when an executive's problems stem from undetected or ignored psychological difficulties, can coaching actually be a bad situation for him, which could make it further worse? I, I think that there are some situations when that is exactly the case. If, if the coach is inexperienced, what happens with an experienced and an, an effective coach is that they will they will very quickly recognise this and they will bring, and they will then um, help this person to to find appropriate professional help. Um, what they won't do is if they are effective you know, if they're a properly qualified and um, a, a, an effective coach is they will not try and plow on and try and resolve the issue themselves. Um, unfortunately, not all coaches are at, le at that level. Um, um, and as the statistics I gave before, that 70% of those that organizations use are not sufficiently um, competent, um, a significant proportion of that 70% are not safe. So I, that's one of the reasons why it's really important to check that your coaches have, um, that you use, whether they're internal or, or external, um, really do have enough of a behavioral science understanding to be able to work in this way. Um, and. <clears throat> um, and, and, and are sufficiently qualified. Okay, great. Um, uh, we have another question. Uh, executive coaching is expensive and time consuming. Should it be reserved only for people who are critical to our organization's success or will be in the future? <laughs> Wonderful question. Um, <clears throat> the answer is, is it, <clears throat> What's the cost of not coaching somebody? Um, would be one of the answers. And it's always, you know, so if somebody just carries on doing things the way they are carrying on, what is the cost of that? Um, and then, so if you take that cost and then you look at the cost of the coaching um, and the, the likelihood of the coaching making a significant difference, you can do the calculation, you get the return on the investment very easily. Um, and sometimes you're going to say it's worth investing that, and sometimes you're going to say it's not. That's one of the reasons why we put increasing stress on using internal coaches. Because most of the time, a well-trained internal coach um, can do everything that an external coach can do um, at a fraction of the cost. Um, I think I said earlier that, 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 that what ch coaches charge is by and large in no way related to how good they are. Um, so um, it doesn't have to be the most expensive person that you bring in. Um, but I would look in depth at their um, at, at their uh, their knowledge of, of, of behaviours, their knowledge, their um, their uh, their philosophy of coaching, and I would and I would observe them. Would you feel safe with this individual? Did you feel this person could actually bring about real change? Um, and if they can't, then they're not worth the money. Okay. Uh... Okay, Mr. Adam seems to be persistent. He has logged back again and asking me to, if you can try to unmute him again. So let me try to do a final. Uh, hello, okay. Adam Tufnell. Can you hear us? Hey, Adam. You there? Hi, David. Hi, Ali. I'm hey. fine. Hey, right. Adam. Fine. Fine. Yeah. Okay, Adam. Please ask a question. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, David. Um, I trust you're well and fine. Indeed. It's uh, just a, a quick one going back to um, one of the things you mentioned in your uh, presentation, uh, and that was in the in the event of having a sort of a board meeting or gathering of minds where a difficult topic needs to be discussed. You mentioned you broke down sort of the three questions that everyone wrote down 
before the commencement of the meeting and then discussed and then the follow up yeah. by the chair at the end. I wonder if yeah. perhaps you could just go into slightly more detail, so sort of the three questions um, sort of you, you, you'd have people write down and then also the, the follow up from the, from the chair. Yeah, well the three questions are, are, are what do you want to say, what do you want to hear, what do you want to achieve? Okay. Uh, and, 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 and those, and, and we really get people to reflect, we try and get them to reflect for five minutes. Mm -hmm. Now that's an awful lot of change, some people find that difficult, but you, you need at least two or three minutes to do it. Yeah. And, um, and you, 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 then as you, as the chairperson is always the last person to read out what they've said. Mm -hmm. And so you go around and each, and you ask everybody to, to, to read out their notes. You can, you can ask, you can say, I didn't understand that. Would you explain that, what you meant by that? Mm -hmm. But you can't, but the chairperson is there to make sure you don't go into greater depth. So it's, not, it's, not, it's just about getting the understanding of the principles there. It's not about getting into detail. Or any okay. discussion. Of, yeah. Now okay. once everybody has said, said what they, they wanted to say, uh, yeah. or read out what they want, what their, their answer to three questions, now you can start the actual dialogue. And it, it, it just is it's a completely different dialogue. Because normally what happens is the extroverts pile in while the introverts are still thinking about what the question is. Um, and, then the, the, and then there's one bunch of people in the room who decided they know what the answer is and want to move on to the next, agenda, next item on the agenda. And the other half are still there thinking, I'm not really sure about that. Mm -hmm. So it creates a much more um, collaborative kind of conversation. And that's and then the and then that sort of uh, and they've obviously tried that in in practice. And then is do you have a formula that you can kind of follow for the you know sort of the chair would then follow at the end to make sure there was buy-in? Yeah, well, what the chair would the chair would do would, would basically say, I think we've come to a consensus here. Now, is there and, and he would go round everybody and say, you know, and ask them, is there anything you want to say or, or anything that you haven't achieved from the objectives you you read out earlier? Mm -hmm. Um, and then and if anybody says, um, well, actually, I'm really still not happy about this, um, then you can continue the conversation until they are. And seek that resolution, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> um, but this, 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 this way you really, you, you get much, much more honesty around the table. And I think you can get it from an engagement perspective as well. Yeah. And everyone's, everyone's it's a leveler for the, as you, as you say, a leveler for the extroverts and a, uh, an empowerment for the for the more introverted uh, sort of yeah. personality types. Yeah, and when we're doing team coaching, um, I've just been teaching a bunch of coaches, um, helping them to upgrade from individual coaches to team coaches uh, just last week. Um, <clears throat> one of the big transitions that we, that, 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 or one of the skill sets that we that, that we help them to acquire is what what you do when a group starts. You know, you've got half of the team is in one place, and the other half of the team is in another place. Um, you know, how do you actually get them to come together? Uh, so one of the techniques that, that people we, 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 that we get people to, to use is um, if you've got one half of the group that are racing ahead and the other half are not really happy, um, mm -hmm. you send the first group into a, into a completely different room and ask them to think of all the reasons why the solution they think is right wouldn't work or what could go wrong. And then you've taken the pressure off the other group who are now, who don't feel, and because they were, they're not so pressured, they could be more creative. And so half an hour later you bring the two groups back together and wow! They're both they're so much closer, and then you come to a conclusion. So yeah, you've, you've had one group that sort of pretty much break down the, the central pitfalls and, and falls and failures, yeah. um, which, was, which, was, which was quite interesting. Um, I've, Ali, I've, I've sort of another sort of, sort of question which follows on from that, if that's okay. If you can be quick. Sounds like it. <laughs> okay, it. sure. Yeah. Yeah, very, very, very quickly. It's just um, again in response to if you're going into the organisation um, and it's sort of in, in disarray, then what would you sort of in, in sort of three bullets? How would you say is the um, is, is the approach to, to bring everyone online in the coaching? In, in, so in, going to no coaching at all, and then suddenly you go in. What would you do? If there's no coaching at all, I, I would, I would, I, I'd start by asking. You know, what are the small gains you want to have at first, the, the critical gains that you, you want to have at first? So, and, 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 and I would relate, relate those immediately to the business priorities. Um, okay. Uh, so you, 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 there's no way that you can change an entire organization in a short, in, in a short period of time without changing all the people in the organization. So um, we would certainly go in and do um, a, 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 some kind of climate survey to understand the barriers to coaching. Mm -hmm. um, 
and we would actually look for the, uh, the, the, the positive, the, the areas where people are actually doing these things or people are particularly open to it. Um, okay. and indeed, I, I was with an organization just yesterday and we were, we were trying to isolate or identify the um, half a dozen teams where the line managers will be most, most willing and, and, and up for becoming and turning their teams into, in, or creating a coaching culture in those, their teams and how we would actually protect them as they did that to demonstrate the whole process. Right. That's, that's great, David. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ali. All right. Thank you very much, Adam, for your present question. I'm glad we were able to connect you. Let me move to another caller uh, who's raised your hand. We have Br Brother Pass. Brother Pass. Basam, could you please introduce yourself and ask a second? Yeah, this is Basam. Hello? Yes, Basam, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Yes, Basam, we can hear you. Please okay, go ahead. Okay, very good. Um, one of the definitions on, uh, on coaching is uh, um, providing the direction, removing obstacles, uh, uh, opening up possibilities, and improving performance. And a lot of managers um, tie coaching to performance reviews. Yes. Um, and they, yes. Come, and they yeah. come back saying, yes, I'm coaching. I've done two performance reviews for this employee this year. Um, the, uh, and I think one of the key things is, seems, and I, you haven't touched on that, maybe because I missed the first few slides actually, um, is the uh, clarity between coaching and performance reviews. Um, that's one. Number two is, um, I think I'm not really convinced on coaching teams. I see coaching teams um, is really more of a of a uh, helping them line up their uh, their uh, their activities, lining up their goals, identifying weaknesses in the team. Uh, a lot of that comes with the um, team um, exercises and team improvement activities that take place. So uh, just these two points I wanted to raise, David, and thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, okay, so, um, okay, so I'm, 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 I'm trying to say so much on the second one. I, for, I, I forgot the first one, so I'll deal with the second one first. I think the, the issue about team coaching is, is, is about helping the team to develop the habits of learning and ways of working together to improve the learning, and therefore out of that comes improvements in, 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 in performance. Um, so, uh, I, th th I mean, some of my colleagues, we, there's been a lot of big debate, is, is there such a thing as team coaching or is it something else? Um, and most of the, 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 um, the, 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 the consensus is that team coaching is a separate additional skill that you, that you can add. And it's basically coaching but taking into account the dynamics and treating the team as an entity, as if the team was a personality but with multiple split, multiple sub-personalities within it. Um, so, but there's a lot of debate. I mean, you're opening up an issue there, which I think is 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 still a debate. How much is team coaching a separate thing, and how much is it is 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 it, is it actually um, uh, an amalgam of other things? Um, I think that that will emerge uh, uh, over time. Um, and you're also talking about the definition of coaching and, how, and tying it to 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 um, to to, to, um, uh, to appraisal. Uh, one of the interesting uh, phenomena uh, that um, that's happened in, in the last four or five years is the growing trend for organizations to throw away their performance appraisal systems. Um, one of the most recently publicized was Adobe, um, which has found that it's actually improved performance dramatically by throwing out, out its performance appraisal. Uh, it's also got rid of more poor performance as a result as well, um, which is counterintuitive, but um, actually relates to the fact that, that that's, um, when you people are not really honest in performance appraisals on the whole, um, and um, they aren't they aren't it's very difficult to make them into a developmental activity. Um, so I, I think there's there's some big questions as to as to um, whether whether you really need want to link coaching too much to performance appraisal, or rather to drink link it more broadly to to, to how people look at their performance and what they want and when people decide they want to do something about an aspect of performance how you support them in doing that so uh, perhaps another way of putting that is you, you you bring in coaching when somebody has decided they want to make a change not in order to make to enforce somebody to make a change which is how it's so up been so often used and ineffectively used in all within organizations uh, to, to date 
Now, there's a big movement, I, I, I think, to, 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 to shift um, a coaching a, some, a little bit further away from performance appraisal. Uh, and and I, th I guess I, I think that's, that, that's, that's pretty positive. Um, if, if you, when you're doing, one of the reasons for this seems to be that the more that you link performance appraisal and, um, and coaching, the more that, that you take the accountability away from the individual, the, the appraisee, um, for their own development. Um, and um, so the more you expect, more you, you, sort it out, you sort it out for me, you let me go on this course. So, so you create all sorts of negative issues. Uh, I think, again, it's a fascinating area, one we, 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 which is under-researched. Um, but certainly the trend at the moment is to, is to separate out um, performance appraisal and coaching and rely on, on, on use coaching much more for being things where people have themselves come to the conclusion they need and want to be coached. Um, especially, and, and one of the definitions that we use of both coaching and mentoring, or developmental coaching, developmental mentoring, is helping people with the quality of their thinking about issues that are important to them. And if performance in some area is important to you, you need to be helped to think, or the, the coaching will help you think about how you deal with that. So it's the, it operates on the quality of the thinking, not on the quantity. Yeah, th thanks a lot. This is I've done so many reviews and performance reviews in my life, and uh, many of them I felt were uh, very awkward uh, because of the reasons, the many reasons that come with performance reviews. Um, what you just shared is very intriguing, and I will look into it further. Thanks a lot for sharing that. Brilliant. There, there, there's, um, if you go on the web, you'll find the Adobe case study a number of places. Web, you'll find. Yeah. Well. Uh, Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Brother Wassim, for your question. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Brother Wassim, for your question. And um, let me move to another short question in the question box as we're running out of time now, but we can take just this one last question. Uh, this is industry specific from Brother Haytham Muhammad. The question is What kind of KPIs we can use to coach low performer employees in automobile industry? <laughs> right. That's very specific. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think it doesn't really matter whether it's the automobile industry or any other. It's, um, if the, it's the fact that they're a low performer um, and the level at which they are in the organization. So if it's a low performer at top management, you've got more problems and you would need to invest more um, time and energy to, to, um, to, 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 to help them um, than you might do a low performer out on the, on the assembly line. Um, it, the cost of replacing one of the, the former is much higher than the cost of replacing the latter. Uh, but you, 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 when somebody is a poor performer, it, 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 it comes from a number of reasons. Um, and in our recent researches, we've been, we've been looking at a phenomenon um, um, which relates to how we, rel how we regard people's jobs. Um, and one of the things that, we, that, that, that comes out from this is that People go into a job and they're a perfect fit for it. They appear to be a perfect fit for it. And they may, at any level, be really good in that job for a couple of years. But then the, the context changes. The, what's needed in that job is no longer what they have. It doesn't play to their strengths. And so what we do is take this successful person and turn them into a failure by performance managing them and appraising them as, <coughs> as, as missing targets and so forth. We, and when, what we should have been doing is monitoring the fit of the individual with the role and then, look, and, and, and then using coaching or mentoring to help them think about how they either change the role or move to a new one. And it could be that move within, within the organization or move to another one. But at the moment, we spend all our effort putting somebody into a job and very little about monitoring them and helping and, and monitoring the fit of that person with that job as the job changes and as they change. And so the, the review process shouldn't be, is it, we review people's performance, that's irrelevant. What we really want to be, 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 be re reviewing is the fit of the job with that individual, and in particular, in relating to the energy and the strengths that they can bring to it. When you do that, if, the, you, if, if you use coaching for, in that purpose, you can actually, tell, I mean, you, you can have really good relationships with people, even if the, the end result is that you, set, that you both agree that they are no longer the right person for the job that they're in. Hey, 
well, Professor, that really brings us towards the end of the webinar. And I would like to thank you on behalf of Mal for uh, giving this presentation, which indeed turned out to be very, very interactive. Um, any concluding remarks that you would like to give before we dismiss out? Um, I, I just think it, it, it's, it's really important for organizations to think, if you want to have a coaching culture, are you prepared to make the investment that is going to be, is going to be required? Um, because it, it's, not, it's not just the money, that's, that's, that you, can, you don't actually have to spend a lot of money doing it. One of the things we found is, again, there's no correlation between spend and impact uh, in this. Um, you can be smart and spend very, relatively little. But it's, it's, the, it's the amount of time and the energy and the focus um, within, within the management structure. Um, how, are you prepared to put the mindfulness, the, 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 the attention and the energy into creating a coaching culture? If you are, the benefits are enormous. Absolutely. And uh, thank you very much once again uh, for this presentation, Professor. And thank you all of those who participated in this webinar and for posting this uh, uh, for posting the questions. Uh, we are recording this webinar. The recorded version will be uploaded on Mild Community, which is community.mild.org in the next couple of days. I've already uh, broadcasted the link towards uh, the soft copy of the presentation of this webinar, which you can download from Mild Community. Uh, with that note, I would like to end this uh, webinar. So you all have a good day, good evening, good night, wherever you're calling from. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.